um, like to segue and introduce our speaker, Alice Cantalo. She is a fourth generation California native plant advocate who became interested in wildfire preparation when she was asked as a master gardener, she wears two hats, to join Mark and Robin Stanley in their defensible space presentation eight years ago. Mark is a retired deputy chief for Cal Fire and taught Alice much about the firefighter's perspective on fire. When her brother-in-law lost a house in the campfire two and a half years ago, the subject really hit home. Since then, Alice has delved deeply into all aspects of how to protect homes from fire. She and Lester joined others to co-found the Oak Hill Area Fire Safe Council, where she serves at the, as the chair for defensible space and hardening homes. With a bachelor's in geochemistry and a master's in business administration, Alice works to understand the scientific uh, and uh, economic perspectives of fire, weeds, and native plants. And she was also almost attacked by a bear <laughs> as a student. Okay. Alice. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. And um, I just want to say one thing real quick, too, about what Deb mentioned about the Pine Hill um, volunteering with the science, with the citizen science. It's really an amazing opportunity, and I really recommend it. Um, Lester and I have been doing it. It's a lot of fun. Okay, living with wildfire um, and native plants too. I wanna to thank you all for coming today and caring about this topic because it's one that's really, really important right now in California. And for people who are living in the WUI, we'll be talking about that and some of the responsibilities that come with that. I'm also gonna be talking about some basic fire science and wildfire behavior, how wildfire works. And there's some great recent research on what actually helps homes survive do some examples before and after. We're gonna have a little exercise. We're gonna do some fine tuning where we look at your specific property. And lastly, I'll be looking at uh, future wildfire trends in the county and in California. And one thing I guess before we get started, if you wanna just grab um, a piece of paper, an empty piece of paper and a pencil, we'll be using that later in the talk and give you about a minute to grab that. I should have said something before and I forgot. Okay. I'm going to assume most people have found a piece of paper to grab. Great. So when you see a picture like this, first of all, just think about the emotions that brings up. Because fire has so many different aspects. So think about that for a second. And then in California, of course, fire has been here for millennia, for forever. And the native flora that are here have evolved with that fire. And in fact, the indigenous community has harnessed its force. And so fire is not necessarily always a negative thing. And for many, many, many years, it has been uh, actually a lot of positive to it. If you look here at the fire poppy, I've never had the opportunity to see this myself. But um, this is an amazing plant that really shows up after fire. Of course, our Sequoia gigantea has to have fire because its cones can't open unless there is fire. You can see how the tough bark on this tree has managed it, has allowed it to survive many fires. Our own Stebbins Morning Glory here on Pine Hill Preserve um, really likes it when it suddenly it has a lot of opening when the, the um, bushier plants above it are gone and its seeds kind of like the heat. And so sometimes there are plants that really respond well to fire as Deb and Jenna has been finding out in their research too recently. And so the kinds of fires that the indigenous people used to foster were these uh, little surface fires where, because a lot of the undergrowth was um, regularly burned, and so these low intensity fires would come through. Um, I'm sure you've heard about that. And just to give you another idea about just how much each individual species has adapted to fire, this is kind of a fun one is the knob cone pine. It occurs in pockets throughout the Sierra foothills and also up in Northwest California. And its strategy, instead of having a real thick um, bark like that Sequoia gigantea, it has actually a pretty thin bark and lots of resin and it is ready to burn and die because what it does is early on from like four till 10 years, four to 11 years or so, it's already starting to reproduce, which is amazing for a pine tree. It's already making pine cones. And then those pine cones don't stop, fall off. They stay with the tree. And so the tree continues to grow and the pine cones stay. They won't open without fire. The tree grows really fast. And finally around 75, 80 years, it kind of burns out and dies. 
And normally if the fire interval is right, then you know, somewhere is around 50, 60 years, somewhere in there, a fire will come through, it'll burn really hot, it'll burn and get those cones opened and the process will, will um, proceed from there. But if the fire interval is changed, if it's either really long, then the, the tree still dies around year 80 years and falls and there's no fire to open the cones. And so they just kind of slowly rot. Um, with other trees um, or chaparral or other things, if the fire interval is too short, then it might happen before they ever had a chance to um, make their seeds. So all of these native plants are really tied to the fire interval that they're used to, which varies a lot between um, habitats and between locations within habitats. So even though California has had this long history of, of wildfire, there's, it's very different today. Um, we've been f suppressing fire for 100 years or more. And this isn't just up in the forest. This is where we all live. And part of it now is, I mean, when a big fire happens, the first thing they have to do is try to suppress it because so many of us live within the, within the area. And so even though we may give lip service to wanting to have ecological fires, in reality, pretty much every time a fire happens, it gets suppressed. There's been a huge upsurge in large wildfires um, in the last uh, years and definitely a change in the fire return intervals. In some places, it's shorter than it used to be, especially in Southern California Chaparral, and that's a problem. In other places, like in our forests and around where most of us live, it's probably longer now than it used to be, especially without the indigenous burning. And one thing that that can lead to is type conversion in some areas. It actually changes from one habitat to another. And then the big things that I'm going to be talking about today is a huge loss of human life and homes and billions of dollars to cost uh, to try and suppress it. And not just billions of dollars to go into the firefighting, but the many, 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 many more indirect costs that are affected by that and the community are really hurt by it. So if you look here real quickly at the total acres burned by fires in California, you can see that it was kind of going along slowly increasing and then came 2000 and let me get this out of the way went all the way even off the chart here at 4.4 million so just looking at acres though isn't necessarily what we want to really focus on because like i said california is has had this long history of fire suppression it's not a terrible thing for fires to finally burn but it is when our houses are in the way and so if we look here at structures destroyed, and here you can see again, that's, that huge peak is 2018, which would be the campfire, um, which is something like 19,000 structures. And then 2019 was much lower, but then 2020 came along and again, 10,000 structures. So you can see a huge increase in the losses of uh, structures. It's kind of interesting. If you look here at the uh, Henley file, which was 1964, that's the red line. The black line under it is the Tubbs fire, which happened in just uh, 2017. So for the 1964 fire, th these two fires are almost in the exact same spot. And no, no deaths. You can see, so the two, by 2017, when we had the Tubbs fire, 5,600 structures and 22 deaths. So the fire is more, perhaps more intense, but also there's just a lot more structures in in the area. And so this is part of why it's becoming such a huge problem. And part of what happened with the Tubbs fire too, is you hear people talk about the WUI, which is the wildland urban interface being the problem. But here's a situation where the wildland uh, was out here. This is Highway 101 and that fire jumped six lanes of freeway. And this is a coffee park, which is really an urban area. That's where a lot of the loss was in that fire of those 5,600 structures. And so this really became an urban conflagration. So we have a whole new situation developing now with WUI. So again, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the human life, well, not the human life, I'm going to be focusing on homes um, and the and trying to reduce the cost of trying to suppress them. Because if we're spending all that money trying to suppress them, we're not able to spend uh, money well to prevent them or to prevent the loss to our homes. So you've probably seen this map. This is the state of California. There are fire hazard severity zones that CAL FIRE makes. This was done back in 2007. They're actually in the process right now of redoing it, which will be very interesting to see. The, um, the yellow is the moderate fire risk areas. There's a darker color here that is the high um, severity. And then the very high severity is the red. 
And all these white areas doesn't mean that there's no fire hazard there. It just means that that's probably federal land. But down here in the desert, it really does mean that there's not a lot of uh, fire going on down there. So if you look here specifically at El Dorado County, um, you can see that pretty much from El Dorado to Placer, excuse me, El Dorado Hills to Placerville, north of the freeway, it's mostly moderate fire prone. And moderate is still considered fire prone. And so it's um, still um, not what they would think of as being good. South of Highway 50, we have both uh, high severity and also very high severity. Between Placerville and Pollock, it's mostly um, very high severity zone, which is like the, the top, which is why so many of us can't get uh, fire insurance. Um, and But what's interesting, before you, you sit back and are happy that this is nice and yellow, if we look now at another map that was done by Cal Poly down in um, um, San Luis Obispo, they took CAL FIRE data also, and they created what they called the threat. And if you look here, that's basically the potential fire severity, and it includes the WUI fires that can include the windblown embers that can result in those urban conflagration I talked about with the Tubbs fire. So you can see how much of California is in a really high threat area. And again, if we look at El Dorado County, um, it's just the reverse, where the very high is down in the lower parts of the county, and the high is here. But still, it's all it's all very high. Uh, it's all high enough that we should worry. So the moral is, we're all just like most of uh, the Sierra foothills and over on the other side of the valley. A lot of California is at a lot of risk. So real quick, I want to do a, a poll to find out um, how many of you live in the town, a town, how many live on acres, how many live um, in a rural area, which would be more than 40 acres, and which kind of habitat is are the wildlands that are nearest you. So I think Kathleen has a poll she can put up for us. Great. You guys could just real quick do that. Can't see it quite yet. Okay, hold on. Let me show the screen. Sorry. Okay. Okay, this is great, guys. This really helps me out. Okay, so we do have some people who are living in town and city, and I'm really glad that you're with us today and you recognize that even though you're in a town, you can also be quite vulnerable from wildfires. Um, looks like most people are on one acre and a few people are on those large pieces of property. I will be probably focusing a lot more on the town and the city and the more than one acre, but um, I do have some resources that might be good for those folks. And in terms of habitat, looks like most people are on oak woodland, which is where I also live. Um, although I guess I'm more mixed oak conifer. Um, we don't have too many people in the conifer forest or the grasslands, so it's mostly oak and chaparral it looks like. So thank you so much, guys, that helps. Okay, Let's see if I can get that off. So there are a lot more wildfires than just the big ones. In 2020, you know, which was definitely a year of big fires, still there were 9,600 wildfires by the middle of December. I think that went up just a little bit after that. And most of those are put out. Most of them are kept at 10 acres or less. And so, we want to protect our house against those too, all those small fires. And yet we also would like to protect ourselves against the mega fires, the ones like the campfire up in Paradise and Megalia in 2018. And at first people were thinking, oh, there's nothing anybody can do about those giant fires. And now they're realizing, you know what there really Alice, is. Alice, yep. hit share screen again. Oh, thank you. I think I took okay. it away with the poll. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, here we go. Did I miss a couple of slides or was it just this one, I think? Okay. So anyway, what I was saying was that we real they realize now that people really can do something to help themselves against the mega fires like campfire that we're not that we're not um, unable to help with those also. So let's look for real quickly at how fire gets going and how something like a house catches on fire. And you've probably heard of the triangle, but I like to think of it more this way, that you need heat, you need fuel, and you need air. Just like when you're making a campfire, um, you would have heat would be the match, 
the fuel would be, you'd have to have some small fuel there, some tinder to catch the larger fuel on fire. Same way you can't really take a match and just put it next to a big log and expect it to catch on fire. And you need some air, which is why um, some of us will build campfires either in teepees or these little log cabins. If you think about it, the house is the same way. Um, it needs the same things, heat, fuel, and air. And we'll be thinking about that um, as we talk the rest of the um, presentation here. And the same thing with the fuel. You've got to have small fuel that's going to catch your larger fuel of your house on fire. And it's got to have oxygen. But look at that house. It's got all that air inside, all the air outside. Um, it's really, and, and all that wonderful dry wood inside. Your house is a wonderful um, fuel, a wonderful place for a fire to catch. Now, as for where exactly the heat comes from, from. Um, it can come from a number of places. Uh, maybe the first one people think of is a wall of flames, so that's going to come up and burn your house. And it can, especially if it's a crown fire. And that's what we really want to avoid. A crown fire is a fire that goes all the way from the bottom of the, of the landscape all the way up through the vegetation to the tops of the trees. And those fires are about four times as fast as that little surface fire we saw earlier that was just, you know, mucking along on the bottom of the forest floor. And so these crown fires are what we were trying to avoid um, with our defensible space so that it doesn't come up to our house. But that's one, one way that the heat can come, but really more often it can be radiant heat. And so let's say you are in one of these subdivisions like this and there's a wildland off to your right and along comes one house burns on, uh, catches fire. That one house catching on fire, just the radiant heat from it, like the heat you get from a nice campfire magnified way more by a big house burning is enough to catch both houses on either side on fire and from there, to spread to large areas. And that has turned out to be a much bigger problem people realized. And that's how things sometimes go really south, like in the Tubbs fire and the campfire, too much destructive fires were homes that were burning other homes right next to them. And yet even with those two, it's still the, the most important way or the, the most common way. And in fact, this accounts for 60 to 90% of home ignitions in California would be from embers. And these are just these little embers usually, and you don't even see them during the day, but they're there. And then at night you can really see them and they can just be um, extremely numerous. And so even though maybe one individual one doesn't have a lot of energy, all of them together, especially if they pile up in one area can have quite a bit of heat and quite a bit of energy. They can also be large like this called, you know, kind of fire brands. Um, so it's those embers that we have to really be thinking about that can catch our houses on fire. Here's an example in the Angora fire, which I think is 2007 up in South Lake Tahoe. Look at the vegetation. These bushes didn't burn, the trees didn't burn, but an ember came in and struck something next to this house and caused the entire house to burn down. And this is not unique. This is the kind of thing they saw a lot of in these large fires. So coming back to the fuel then, we talked about the heat. The fuel is anything that will burn. Of course, it's dry or dead vegetation, but it's also live vegetation. The live trees, live shrubs, live perennials, especially if they're woody, but even if they're not, pretty much those will all burn. And your wood siding, your roofing, your decking, all those wonderful dry wood, those are very much fuel. And so though are brooms and your recycling bin and your wood furniture, the whole building. Basically, it's everything except for maybe rock, concrete, and metal. And just looking real quickly at why it is that live plants burn, <laughs> Um, if you think of the live foliage here as having both dry foliage and then it's got water and that water content is is usually expressed as a percentage of the dry foliage but in the dead fuel you still have a little bit of water it's usually um, directly representative by the humidity is depends on what that so that goes up and down daily this goes up pretty much by season but what happens when a hot fire comes by that water gets evaporated and once the water evaporates then the dry foliage burns. And so that's why even live things can burn. So how best to protect? How can we protect our fires, our, our houses from the small fires and the mega fires? And fortunately, lots of people have been really studying this pretty intensely, especially in the last five years or so, but for quite a while. And they've really found some good things. And, the, and we have to remember that again, as these things burn, it's not just a house. It's not just a structure, it's not just fuel to us, it's a home. And it's all the mementos of this person and it's just um, tremendous loss to lose a home. Alice, do you want questions while you're speaking or um, 
on um, that's topic. a really good question. I think if it's okay with folks, because unfortunately I have a lot of slides, um, if we could wait till the end, I'd okay, like go. to do that, unless they seem like they really are pertaining right now or if I really missed something. Then She's talking about the flammability of well hydrated vegetation. Can they okay, catch the embers and then catch on fire? I think that's what I was just talking about. Even the well hydrated yeah. vegetation. It just it takes a little longer. You have to. It'll have a little bit more of that water content, but it will evaporate, and then it'll certainly will help because the more water you evaporate. So what they've done to try to figure out, you know, how does what matters, what we can do to help our um, home survive. They've done two basic things. One, there are people who are studying the homes that survive and the ones that don't. This I think is the campfire. You can see there's a home like this that's perfectly fine, and all these homes here that were completely destroyed. So they really have done some studies of those. And one thing that CAL FIRE is doing, which is kind of neat, they've, they started this back in the 1980s, but they got much more, um, what, not serious, but um, there's a better process now where they, they go, it's called the DINS process, which is the damage inspection. And these yellow lines here are where they go to a area that's burned into the perimeter of the fire, and they walk around every single house that is there. And they determine whether it's destroyed, partly hurt or is undamaged. In this particular case, all those red houses were completely destroyed. And this is the campfire, I believe. But you can see how they walked around every single house and tried to figure out, okay, what kind of eaves did it have? What kind of roof did it have? What kind of windows did it have? Um, and they use this kind of Trimble-like um, uh, computer thing to, to do that, not computer, electronic device. Another approach that other people are taking is they've actually done some empirical experiments, whether they actually build houses with different features and then they bombard them with embers, just like in a real fire, and they see what happens. A lot of this is happening, especially in South Carolina, by the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. There's also a facility, I think, up in Montana and possibly even one in California with UC. So what they're learning from all this is that we don't need to be sitting ducks. There are things we can do. And I like to think of it sort of as a three-prong approach. There's the house, and you and the hardening the house is really important and something that wasn't really emphasized particularly much five, ten years ago. And so you're hardening it against those embers that are coming in, even if there's not a wall of flame. The other big thing, of course, is the defensible space, having a belt around the home that of fire resistant landscaping. And the third prong of this approach is the wide access. And that's really important too, is the road. And no one of these things alone is gonna help us or how survive as much as all three of them together. And so let's start actually with the road real quick. Oh, that's right, there is a kind of a fourth. And this is becoming more and more upfront. Um, I know our county is actually in the process of revising some of the water tank requirements and so they're looking more closely at how water tanks can actually be helping houses too but I, I won't be focusing on that in this talk because it's in the middle of being revised so back to the road so if a, a fire chief um, like say mark stanley who i had worked with earlier or given presentations with if he, he was on a um, fire truck as he was early in his career and he came to a road like this you probably wouldn't have the same reaction that you or I would. Your eye might see this and think, oh, what a nice country road that looks so quaint and so nice and lovely. And to him, he's thinking, okay, this is a narrow road. There's overhanging trees. Is there a way out? Do I want to go in there with my crew and risk their lives? No. And so it's kind of like triage. Think about the fire trucks out there doing triage. And if your road looks like that, there's a good chance they're going to pass it right by. They don't even know for sure if, if your house is back there. And if you haven't done anything to try to help your road, that's not going to be the first one they're going to go try to help. So what some communities do is they've gotten together and really try to do something because we have a lot of narrow rural roads here and um, people can get together as a community and um, just really help on the sides. And even if the road's already skinny, you can just do something, even if there's turnouts like the green here and just having less stuff to be burning when you're going through, even with the trees limbed up can really help. So that was the road now if we go to the other end back up to the house i think this is a good thing to think about you know we don't fight earthquakes tornadoes or hurricanes but somehow we expect people to come and put out our fires for us but maybe instead we should be adapting and building smarter just like we do for earthquakes tornadoes and hurricanes 
So one thing after these experiments and studying the homes that burned and didn't, they changed the code in 2008. Uh, well, they revised it actually before that too, but they made some dramatic changes by 2008 that affects pretty much every part of the house, the roofs, the vents, the decks, the windows, the eaves, the siding. And of course, not all of us are living in brand new houses, however. In fact, in our particular fire safe council, I think 2% of the homes were built those things we can learn from the codes that are required of new houses that we can actually retrofit our, our, our houses to. And these codes only apply to wooey houses and ones that have either moderate, high, or very high uh, fire risk. But as you saw, that was pretty much everybody in our county. So here would be um, a house that was built with all those, uh, you know, a brand new house built with all those things. And I wanted to show you just the soffited eaves. Some people aren't sure what a soffited eave is. It's just um, instead of an eave that's open, you know, you actually see the rafters, it's closed in so that you don't. And so the vents end up being um, pointing down instead of this way. So instead of facing the embers, they're pointing this way with the embers and that can really help. Also double pane windows, some siding, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the roof specifically. So for the roof, it needs to be class A. Now, anytime you're going to re-roof, you definitely want to put on a class A roof. And roofs go by class A, class B, class C, with A being the best, the most fire resistant. But you have to be careful because it also matters on how it's constructed. Even if you have a class A roof like this tile that doesn't burn, the problem is it has holes. And in, in those holes, if you have plywood, that can be a place where those embers can get and you can easily burn down your house, even though you think you have a nice class A roof. Same thing here, this was a metal roof. They had a gap underneath here where the embers were able to get underneath. This was in the car fire in 2018 and they ended up fortunately not losing the whole house, which is a little unusual because usually they find in these fires that once it catches on fire, most of them go the whole way or at least are what they call destroyed. Also relating to your roof is um, you really don't want to have a lot of leaves in your gutter. And so the problem with that, of course, as you all know, is we have a lot of, especially if you're living in oak woodland, like so many of us are, um, it's not the kind of thing you can do just once. You'd have to get up there almost once a week or even more in the fall. And so because of that, gutter guards can be really effective. And there's lots of different kinds. Not all of them work very well. There's even foam ones that burn. Um, but the ones that are metal micro mesh, and there's a number of different brands, seem to work really well in our area, even if you have pine uh, needles. But also you can see this metal flashing right here that goes under the roof and over the fascia board. And that can be really important too, because then at least if, if, if you do have some leaves in your gutter, it won't burn plywood right there. So that can be helpful also. Vents are another thing, both the low ones down at the bottom of your foundation vents and also the ones up high um, at the, you know, the bottom of your eaves. Um, and they make some fancy ones here that are approved that um, have a honeycomb that actually melts together when it gets really hot so that that's really good for even the flames if you happen to have flames coming through. But if you've kept plants away well from your house, you might not need anything so fancy. Um, just plain, really narrow um, mesh, like 1 16th inch even. They, they want it to be at least 1 8th inch, but 1 16th inch is even better at keeping those embers out of your attic or your foundation. Um, and the only problem is, of course, that by going to 1 16th inch, if you had one quarter inch before, which was they used to think was enough and it's just not, you've reduced the ventilation in your attic. And so you probably need to put in just a few more vents. But this is, can be a nice, uh, cheap, relatively cheap alternative to retrofitting. For the windows, the code for new houses that needs to be double paned and one pane is tempered. And the reason for that is because what you see here, when heat comes from a fire, like maybe you're, the walls are starting to burn or there's some plants outside that are burning and the glass doesn't heat the same as the frame. There's a difference between uh, the expansion of the two. And so it's, it's very often happens that it will break. And so if you have one plane, well, it breaks and then the embers are all inside your house and boy, and then it's really all over. But if you have two panes, then hopefully by the time one breaks, the heat is dissipated enough that, because um, really these fires that come through aren't that long that hopefully the second one won't burn too. If you have one pane and it's tempered, all the much better because the temperature is like four or five times stronger than normal glass in windows. So if you're ever redoing your windows, this would be something you would want to do. And if you have single pane windows, you really might think about wanting to change to double pane for that reason, you know, besides uh, energy efficiency. And then for siding, the codes for new houses, it needs to be non-combustible or ignition resistant. 
And what that means, a couple of things, it can either be three coat, three coat stucco, like this person is applying, and you might all recognize Tal down here who is doing some of that to one of her posts. Um, you can also have fiberboard or other fiber cement, and it comes in lots of wood looking fashions. So you can kind of blend it in with the, the wood look you had of your house before. It even comes in a shingle look. The siding tends to be really expensive though, and so redoing ex a whole house with siding, you know, compared to the benefit from that, and I'll be talking about that in a, in a little bit, may not be so um, needed. And you can maybe do it strategically if you're doing a retrofit. Well, if you look at this house here, there's siding right next to the roof. But if you can get material like pine needles collecting here and it's right next to this siding, this is a place where you might want to change that siding out to be something that's ignition resistant. Otherwise, normally with the walls, if they're at least six inches up from the ground level, then you're probably fine because you're going to get maybe one or two inches of embers st stuck there and it won't actually reach the siding. Decks are a special issue, especially here in the Sierra Foothills. Lots and lots of people have decks. And so they, at that same place where they take the buildings and bombard them with embers, they take different kinds of deck boards and they burn them and see what happens. I think it's all at IBHS. Some, actually, UC may be doing some of this too. And as a result of this, there's this great list. Um, it's by CAL FIRE, but it's, I think it's the Office of the Fire Marshal. And it goes through, and there's all kinds of accepted building materials. Now, these are for brand new houses, but if you're rebuilding your deck, you can look at that list and see what um, they consider to be um, much safer for wildfire risk. One problem is that, like, even, even plain wood is on that list as being okay, and that's true when it's brand new like this. But once it starts to age, and then you get all the stuff in between the cracks, then it's a whole nother issue. And, and deck in general are, can be a real vulnerability and there's ways to, um, uh, let's see, let me just mention, I've got a really nice resource list because there's so much material I can't cover everything. So later at the end, if anybody's interested in getting that resource list, it will give you some really nice um, links to really detailed information on decks or roofs or siding that gives much more detail than I'm able to give here. But there are some things you can do with decks such as if it's parallel to a wall, you can take the board off that's right next to the wall and put in a metal board there. And there's some other possibilities for decks. So with the campfire, you know, you kind of wonder, did that code, did it help? And so they looked at the homes that were built before 2008, before those big changes, and 18% of them um, still survived. So they didn't all burn. But for the ones that were after built after 2008 that had all those changes we just talked about, 51% of them survived. Now to me, that's a significant difference and um, makes it worth doing some retrofitting to our houses to try to get them up to the closer to the 2008 code. So let's look a second at what they did when one of those experiments too, where they also tried this. They took one side of the house and they made it, they built it to all those codes. They closed the eaves up, they put on fiber cement siding, they had dual pane windows with metal screens, they increased the joist space on the decking so that it was a little bigger and embers could go through. On the other side, they did everything wrong. They had the uh, redwood deck that was standard spacing, they had mulch that was right up against the, the foundation here, the windows were only single pane. The siding was even wood shingle and the eaves were open and they bombarded it with those embers. And this is what happened after just 10 minutes. This, this one was also bombarded and not, nothing would happen to it at all. There was no damage. Whereas on this side, um, it would have been a complete loss except for they jumped in finally and put it out. You have to remember though that every fire is unique. Every house is unique. And part of the problem too is so is it really all those things you have to have together that make a house survive or is retrofits or there's just a few things that might be especially important. And Sifford and Keeley did a study in 2019 of asking exactly that question and they looked at three areas of California, the Bay Area, the North Interior, which includes El Dorado County and Southern California. And then they had a statewide average over here. And they looked at all these different things that they were, the Cal Fire had been collecting information on those damaged or destroyed homes. And they found, I mean, if you look here, uh, uh, one thing that's interesting is the orange here, which is um, defensible space, does not come out as particularly important 
Because on this side, you see the deviance explained. In other words, the difference between damaged and undamaged homes is not particularly explained by the difference in, in defensible space. But that No one really knows how, what to make of that, including Sifford and Keeley. So it's because people know that defensible space has to be helping, but um, maybe it's not helping quite as much as we all thought originally. But one thing that is coming out pretty big is, are eaves on all these, which is this darker blue one. And so you can kind of look at this, and this isn't an, an end all though to the discussion because, because the information is not always perfect, the data. I mean, when you're looking at a house and you're trying, you know, all you have is an ash field and you're trying to decide what kind of windows they had, it's not always possible. And so they weren't really able to do a multivariate study. They had to just look at one thing at a time, like, does it have closed eaves or open eaves? Does it have a class A roof or not a class A roof? But they couldn't look at, well, did it have a class A roof and closed eaves, but they had a, a plant right there next to their window. So it, it still is something that kind of starts to um, get us thinking about which things might be helping most. And here it is for the North Interior specifically. And again, those eaves are showing is particularly important. The other one that's really important here is defensive action. And the, Part of that is these data for the North Interior are really swamped by the campfire because it includes uh, Butte County as well as our county. And so in, in that particular fire, because they were working so hard to save lives, they really weren't able to do defensive action on most homes. So this, this is really swamped by the campfire data. Austin Troy is another researcher. He's in Colorado and he did a study um, that he did some preliminary results online, presented them in a webinar in uh, last, I think it was February. I haven't seen it actually published yet, so I'm not sure. But these, at the time, he was calling these results preliminary. Most of it agrees with what Sifford and Keeley were saying, although I did point out that mobile homes were perhaps a particular um, vulnerability. But what's interesting is he also looked at what did not affect building survival, which didn't seem to matter. And he had two data sets, not only that damage inspection set we were talking about before, but he had another set of data that included a little bit more of the homes that survived than the DINs data did. And, but what's interesting is he also found that vegetation management at least beyond 30 feet didn't seem to matter much. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it though, it's required in our county. He also found that combustible patios and wood decks weren't particularly important. And um, also they expected to find that the building shape complexity because they know that interior corners are particularly vulnerable, but it didn't really make much difference whether a house was very simple or had all kinds of complex corners. And he found just the opposite that enclosed eaves didn't make an effect on building survival. So again, everything's kind of preliminary and they're still working on this, but definitely hardening homes in some way is helping. And through all of these, what you see uh, it suggests is this priority that roofs and vents are the most important, then decks, then windows, finally eaves, and last siding. And it seems like all the studies pretty much agree that roofs are first and siding is last, but the eaves per should perhaps be a higher up on the first priority. But now we've been talking about that. Let's go ahead and start looking at vegetation, which is the other huge piece of this puzzle, and um, or rather of this preparation needed. And certainly hardening home can help. So now we're gonna focus on the defensible space. And basically what we're trying to do is we have three goals with defensible space, trying to prevent any kind of a crown fire or a fire, um, you know, wall of fire from coming from vegetation to vegetation to vegetation right up to our house. We're also trying to prevent an ember from coming in and starting a plant on fire, the radiant heat of which will then burn our house or the ember itself will burn our house, again, through the plants right next to our house. And third, we're trying to provide a safe place for the fire personnel to work. And this um, can be very important. So based on that, they've developed these zones of defensible space. I'm sure you'd seen various um, examples of this, but it's important to note that with any time you look at one of these, that they've got this new five foot zone now, which they recognize as being perhaps the most critical of all the defensible space zones. And that first five foot zone should have basically nothing. And what they find is that really, you know, sometimes people will hear, oh, I need 100 feet of defensible space, and they'll come out here and they'll start working here. But what you want to do is start at the house and make sure this first is clear, then move out to the next 30 feet, and then finally out to the final 100 feet. And where you measure from, of course, is not just the house, but also from the deck. And again, that just 
they just can't seem to emphasize enough how critical that um, non-combustible is for the first five feet. And that's hard, hard for some of us to get our heads wrapped around because we're so used to foundation plants that people used to put right along their houses. And probably most of us did that. And now they're really suggesting that if you live in the wooey like we do, in an area of fire proneness like we do, you don't do that. So within that five feet, of course, it's also things, simple things like um, pine needles on top. There's that nice fine fuel to catch the house on fire. But take a look at this house and, and think to yourself, you know, all the places within five feet that have a problem. And of course, if plants all over the place right next to the house, also up this column. This is probably the worst of all the plants right in the windows. As again, you saw how windows are a particular vulnerability. They've got a wooden chair here in the feet. They've got overhanging branches within the five feet. They've got all kinds of things going on in that five feet. So they need to take all that stuff out. This is a hard sell. It also means the plants right next to a railing, a wooden railing, because um, that, again, can just go up those posts, can get the, the deck on fire as a vulnerability as the plants right next to the house. And mulch is a particular problem. You know, we love mulch. It it keeps the soil waste, it um, makes the plants happier, but you don't want it right next to your house or any outbuildings because mulch does burn, and even worse, it smolders. So it can sit there and smolder and slowly bring fire up to your house and Days after a fire passed, the house will burn down from this kind of thing. Back when I showed you that one, it was actually the mulch. They say it was part of this whole house on fire. I think I know the mulch came right up to it. That's what was first burned from the ember, and that brought the fire to the walls and the rest of this house. So this is more what we really want. House. Um, and actually, because when you're inside and you're looking out, you get to see the plants. Not, not necessarily that you want a hill here, that's that's not needed, but the fact that you've got this nice zone right next to your house, walkways or hardscape or even dirt. Um, but of course, you also want to get something like this that's a plant right next to it, or plants like this right next to a wooden deck that then brings it like a fuse right to the house. So I think I've kind of hit that hard five feet, but now let's move out to the next five thirty feet. And they say they want that to be lean, clean, and green. First thing is pretty obvious. You're going to get rid of anything you find out there, pine needles, because they are, are really one of the most flammable mulches you can have. And so in that first third, you don't want much pine needles at all. The other thing you want to do is you just want to break up continuous vegetation. Vegetation not all of flame that crown fire to get going from top to bottom. So you want islands out there, a mosaic. So you've got horizontal spacing and vertical spacing. And just for ornamentals too, it's, it's just for the native plants that are out in the wild part. It's it's for all, your entire landscape is also applied to. So islands or mosaics can look like this. You can have hardscape, a bush there, a couple of bushes together, and then space between them before there's another one. Just something that will break up the fire as it's coming through. Here again, an example of an island um, of bushes that you can have. Here we have a. Let's see what do we have. We have deer brush and we have baccarus down here and probably some kind of a ceanothus in here. So you can have these little islands, kind of 10 foot by 10 foot is what they say is kind of a nice size to think of. And then you want it to be separated by about the same thing from another little island. And of course, you don't want it right underneath the tree. In Chaparral, this is actually something that the, um, I asked the Chaparral Institute about what they thought about this. And, and they said this looked pretty good, that you want to kind of take out about half of the Chaparral plants. And then the ones that you leave, again, we're just in that 30 feet next to a house. Then the ones that are left, you want to prune. So let's say this is one that you've left. You want to take it, just kind of thin out the branches and then also take off some of the top so that it's not quite as high. Um, and then if there's any non-woody vegetation, you want to keep it down to about 12 inches high. You have to be careful though, anytime you do this kind of clearing that you don't get a lot of bare soil because we know what happens with bare soil, you get weeds, you get invasives in there, and that can be a worse fire hazard than what you had before. Because as you know, weeds, non -invas or rather invasive, non-native weeds, can grow very tall, like this star thistle. And fire can go through this kind of a thing 15 times faster than that first surface fire we saw. So the crown fire was four times faster, but these kinds of dry grass and dry weeds could be 15 times faster. 
Another thing you can have out there for frill breaks is hardscape, which is really nice. Um, they don't need any water and they can de definitely break things up. This is even better is to have one like this, like this dry stream bed where the water from rain can actually soak in and keep things moister longer. Rocks make a great thing in your landscape, you know, under the trees, they don't burn. And flowers. Now, these aren't native flowers, but you can have some native flowers and bulbs are a really nice thing to have too, because they, you know, they um, die back by fall when the, and we'll be talking about how fall, of course, I think people pretty much know that fall is a more dangerous time than the spring. So we've been talking mostly about the horizontal clearances, but of course you need the vertical clearance needs to be there too. And that's because you get these ladder fuels where one bush can start the, a smaller tree on fire, which can start a tar, a taller tree on fire, and that can be one of those crown fires. Kind of a standard rule of thumb is that if you have a bush, it needs to be at least three times lower, you know, than its height from a branch above it. Of course, that depends on what kind of um, bush you have here. If it's a real open bush, it maybe doesn't need to be quite so severely below it, but if it's a real dense one like backwards or something, then I think it'd be, you know, three times wouldn't be enough. You'd probably want it more. Limbing up trees is extremely effective because by getting those branches up and above, um, you don't have the chance anymore of the crown fire. And so a lot of people think they need to take trees out, but really usually limbing them up is just fine. Here's another example. I think this is um, John Kipping's house actually. And even though these trees are, you know, certainly within that 30 feet, that's fine. They're well limbed up. They're not touching the house. And so this is a nice example of a really good dispensable space. I know he worked really hard on this. You can, like he has some areas out here where he's got some lower plants, but there's no trees above them. And same thing here. These, there's probably aren't any trees right above this. So this is kind of a nice example of um, some defensible space. Again, lots of times people think they have to cut down their trees and that's just not the case. And you can see how this person, you know, most of their vulnerability is down here by their house. These are some several hundred year oak trees that are near our house. And again, they're kind of close. This one's probably within 10 feet, but that's probably not gonna burn. And just to give you an idea, so here are some conifers and how, what happens in a fire. And you can see how you get a little bit of flame up here, but there's not huge flames on just trunks. And these are oaks here, the same thing. That's a, the fires, the embers are coming through, but the trunks, if you look at them, they're not like putting out huge amounts of flames. So you've done all those things. This is what it can look like. Here's some rational action. This is from the Chaparral Institute. Here's overreaction. And so <laughs> hopefully anybody at a talk like this knows that that's not what you want, but you think about the problems here. First of all, these, these poor people thought they were really gonna make themselves safe. They're probably not as safe as they would be if they had a few trees here actually to intercept the embers. There are some studies that are starting to show that having some trees around can actually make things better. That doesn't even, they're gonna get so many invasive weeds out here, they're gonna have erosion problems. And so it's, it's kind of sad that some people think this is necessary. So we talked up to 30 feet. Let's just real quick look at the next um, from the 30 feet out to 100 feet. It's basically the same thing, only just a little more relaxed. You can have some pine needles there, some leaf litter out there, but you want it to be no deeper than say three inches and it'd be nice to kind of break it up. Um, same thing with your uh, islands, the space and everything can be just a little bit closer, but you still want to really be careful about those ladder fuels so you don't have the whole crown fire coming through. And any dead and dry summer grasses you do have out there should, should be kept down to three to four inch high maximum. And that's out to the 100 feet. And one special thing just to talk about briefly is wildflowers. If you're out there weed eating and you see some wildflowers, you know, it, it makes sense to go around them because if you cut them off, then they're not gonna go to seed and you're never gonna get wildflowers again. So California used to have so many wildflowers and I worry about all of our weed eating, but if you can do that in the spring and leave them as little patches here and there and then come back and get them when they're actually dried out and they've got seeds, you'll get to enjoy wildflowers a lot, a lot more and so will the insects. A couple of special considerations, wood piles are a huge deal. People like to put them under their decks. They like to put them right next to their house. Um, but any of that, a wood pile or a pile of lumber or your propane tank or any outbuildings, your chicken coop, everything should be 30 feet out. Doesn't have to be a hundred feet out, but it should be at least 30 feet out. And it's good to have like 10 feet of mineral soil in all directions. And again, with those decks, we already talked about how they're vulnerable. Make just 
everybody puts stuff under their decks. Don't put stuff under your decks <laughs> and don't put stuff touching your deck. And of course, riparian areas need to be protected. Um, they, they definitely tend to be more moist, of course, that's obvious, but um, you don't want to necessarily clear them as much as you might another area because they're such special habitats that we've lost 95% of them or so in, in the state already. For all of it, for all those zones from zero to 100 feet, it's really important to maintain it. And that's probably, I probably should start with maintaining because that's more important than creating your defensible space in the first, in the first place is keeping it going. You, you know, we have some back risk and it gets us really dead stuff in the middle. And so every five or 10 years, we whack it down to the ground and it comes back nice and lush, things like that. You just have to stay on top of it. It's definitely not a do it once and walk away type of a thing. What about past 100 feet? If 100 feet is good, then 500 feet is even better, right? Not really. Um, it, they, study after study seems to show that you really don't need to have more than 100 feet of space unless you're on a hill. And if it's a really steep hill, you might even need 300 feet, but most of the time, 100, 150 feet is just fine. What you want to do, again, past 100 feet, if you're one of the people who has um, more than an acre and you've got land out there past 100 feet, you want to be thinking about habitat health, resilience, um, basically trying to create a healthy forest out there or a healthy woodland. So these people here have their defensible space, never mind the lawn <laughs> or the non-native plants. But I wanted to focus here on this, that this, you know, that you can have a nice, a nice area out there that's healthy, that doesn't have to look like defensible space. This is not healthy. This is not healthy. This is not healthy. Here we've got all one species, no understory. So think about what a healthy forest looks like. Do some research um, for oak woodlands. You know, where if you have mixed oak and conifers, you know, definitely would have some understory here and there. It doesn't have to be turned into defensible space. Here's some um, blue oak woodland, and again, you can have some dead stuff out there. That's okay. Um, there's critters that need that dead stuff. And here's a nice, healthy-looking chaparral. So if you think about the area beyond the 100 feet, it's been managed with periodic wild and cultural files for millennia. And so what some people of the current culture also are trying to do is prescribe burns. And sometimes people think that that is like the absolute panacea for California's problem. There's an excellent talk by Jim Bishop to the Marin chapter of CMPS in February 8th. It's available online. I think I have a link to it on the resources. We talked about that's really not always the case. Sometimes, yes, but not always. If you do do a prescribed burn, do know you need to know what you're doing, attend a training. There's a five session free webinar that's coming up. I think it's in May that you can look for. It's gonna be online in Mariposa County. Or of course you can hire someone, a fire boss. Oops, that's supposed to be Kip. EQIP funds. There are some funding for some of this stuff. So, so far I've been mostly focusing on removal, which is what I kind of think of as negative gardening. But don't forget the plants can also be moved. You may have some choice plants that you really like, they're really close to your house, so you can just move them. This is not really the necessarily the greatest time to do it. You usually want to do it before spring bud breakout, and that might be too late now. But you can wrap the root ball up in burlap, and orient it the same direction to the sun as you had it before. Keep the hole about the same. We've moved six foot kumquat. We moved a seven foot lilac, a bunch of California roses. Um, so you definitely can move plants if you do it right. And with spring and planting, and you know, don't forget that you're still going to be doing defensible space. So when you pick your plants and you go to put them in, don't put them in that five foot next to your house. Think about how tall is it going to be when it's big? How is it fire prone? Um, do, you know, when it's big and the other plants around are big, are they going to be touching what you don't want? Because so often we'll buy these plants, we get all excited in the spring, and then five, six years down the road, we have to pull them back out again. So you don't really want to have to do that. And here's a, a person who has their things nicely spaced. But what they've done is they filled their yard with little green gas cans because um, junipers, that's kind of what firefighters call them. So when you're making your plant choices and you're trying to decide which ones to remove when you're thinning or which new ones to plant, just be aware that some plants really are more fire prone than others. So you do want to choose wisely. For example, here we have Italian cypress. Look at this thing just absolutely torching. Nothing else is on fire yet. This is the first one that burned. 
Then it started the others burning. Then it started the house next to it burning. And by the time firefighters came and put it out, they'd actually lost a bunch of this house. And this is a different situation with another set of cypress that also burned a whole house down to the ground. So you want to minimize those in the landscape, especially in your first 30 feet, but all the way out to your 100 feet. And what are the characteristics of a, fi of a plant that's particularly flammable? They have a lot of brittle and dead undergrowth. They have resinous leaves and they're often aromatic. So here's a juniper and I was standing here waiting for my COVID shot over at the senior center and I looked inside of this juniper and sure enough, look at all this dead material in there. You can imagine an ember or two, doesn't even have to be very many, you know, going in there, getting that thing on fire. It's right next to the building. So the radiant heat from this then could start this on fire. Even if it had fiber cement siding, it could burn things on the other side of the wall just by the radiant heat. Here's another example of a very fire prone plant fountain grass. Hopefully nobody has pampas grass because that's a, an invasive that you don't want in your yard anyway. But something like rosemary is unfortunately also very flammable. And toyon can be, mostly because it can also get this dead material going. You can either prune the dead material out, or some people have been successful with coppicing, where you actually cut them down. I think when they're not quite this woody, but when it was younger, it could have been coppiced and then it comes back each year. And this is something that the Native Americans would have done. But it's really not about the species of plant so much as the condition. So let's talk about manzanita. A lot of people think of manzanita and they think, oh, that's terribly flammable. Well, in this kind of situation, when it likes to grow like this, yes, it is. It gets a lot of dead material. It's really close to each other. That's, that's a fire hazard. But here's a manzanita at our house. It's about 30 years old. We've, I think once I cut one dead branch off, but it's growing under some black oaks and it's like that. So it's clearly not a fire hazard. Here's one where they've put some manzanita in two different kinds of varieties. It's kind of acting as a ladder fuel to the others. Yeah, that's a fire hazard. So it really depends on the condition and how things are more than the species. If you look at coyote bush or baccarus, so the native form can get very messy and very full of dead material. And this is one that can be moved that you might want to just move out past the 100 feet. I've actually done that uh, at our house. Or you can go to a dwarf form. This is one we had in the front of our house, and there's quite a bit of it, and it's much smaller. But it's still, it still was got pretty thick. They all grew together, and there's a lot of dead material in there, like you can see here. So if it's well-maintained, and we ended up taking out every other one and moving it to a different part of the property, because the birds absolutely love this thing for nesting, and so I'm trying to create another mass like this, but that's further out from our house for them. Um, so again, it depends on how it's, how it's maintained and how it's planted. And what about plants that are fire resistant? Well, old school was to use lawns for defensible space, but that's really not necessary. And they've even found that sod can burn too, just like mulch can. And it is something you can achieve. You can have a fire-wise landscape and it can be a sustainable landscape. It can be full of natives. It can be good for the insects and the birds, and it can be water conserving. It can be all those things and still be fire-wise. So some plants that are fire resistant, then they're t they tend to be uh, deciduous usually. They have kind of an open growth structure like this red bud here. They tend to hold moisture longer and they tend to be low growing. So this one you know, gets maybe 10 feet, 15 feet high. But this is a good example of what shows up on many fire resistant lists. And of course our natives are really important. This is kind of fun. This is a milkweed I planted and within a year. I actually had a monarch uh, caterpillar on it. I haven't seen any more since then, sadly. And we forget that those milkweed are important for other things like milkweed bugs, milkweed, I think that's what they're called, milkweed bugs. And of course, the Dutchman's pipe vine, which is so wonderful that the, this um, particular swallowtail has to have this plant for its larva for the caterpillar. As an adult, it can eat lots of different things, but as a caterpillar, it needs to have this one plant. So it's really important for if we're going to have a sustainable uh, landscape that we're going to have a lot of natives in there, but I'm guessing that the audience today knows that. Another great one in our area is the Sonoma sage. It's actually the only sage, I think, that's native to our county, and it stays nice and low, doesn't need water. It um, is, a, is a great fire-resistant plant. And edibles are another wonderful thing to consider in your garden because they tend to take water, and what a great thing to have in that first 30 feet is some islands of edibles. And don't forget edible trees. Here's a fig tree, which, you know, you have to be careful that it's not something that's going to get away from you into the wild, though. 
And flowers, flowers are great, especially the non-woody ones. Um, on the north side of your house, you know, some of the plants like wild ginger that are shade loving tend to be more fire resistant. And boy, what a great fl uh, flower that one has, doesn't it? I don't know if some of you have that in your garden. It's a great one. Woodland strawberry is another one that stays nice and low, um, keeps its moisture well, tends to be fire resistant. And riparian plants like a spice bush or a western columbine, I tend to, you know, water is so precious in California, I usually don't like to spend it on any plants unless I'm getting them established or if I'm eating from them. But in this case, if you are, do have a plant or two that you want to have near your house, these are some to consider that, that do need some water. And perhaps the biggest superstar of all is an oak tree because it's, they tend to be fairly fire resistant. They are easy to keep limbed up. They are amazing for the insects and other critters. They're like an absolute superstar. If you have them, cherish them. If you don't have them, consider planting an acorn. So we talked a little bit about field moisture. Let's look again at what some graphs actually look like for specific plants. Now this is a white leaf manzanita, which would be the Arctostaphylus vacita um, that's so common in our county. And what's interesting here, okay, so we started in January, we're going to December, and here we have the percent of water. Remember that was as a percent of the dead weight. So that's why you can go up to 200% is basically you have twice as much water by weight as you have of the dead material. So what's interesting is these, these different colors are four different years, 2016, 17, 18, and 19. And so even though the, the moisture in the manzanita varied, depending on whether it was a very wet year or a dry year, by the time you got to September or fall, they were all pretty much the same, whether it was a wet year or not. And so that's interesting that this is kind of where it settles quite a bit drier um, than the, the spring, obviously, although still we're down at 75%. So a manzanita in itself is not horribly uh, fire pr uh, prone. It does manage to uh, keep a good amount of moisture. If we look at, this is um, California live oaks, and they didn't seem to specify a specific species of live oak. And this was at about the same place as the last one, 1750 elevation, same thing. You know, depending on the year, it kind of varies a little bit during the, the spring, but by the time you get to fall, it kind of settles on here no matter what kind of a year it was. So just because it's a wet year doesn't mean that the vegetation isn't still going to be pretty dried out by fall. Here we have a specific interior live oak. Now we're up to 3,500 feet elevation. Again, the same thing. And look how different though. This one is at about 75% where it levels off for fall. So it's, again, it's still got um, some moisture, but look at the ponderosa pine at roughly the same elevation, 4,000 feet. It's almost down to zero. So it varied quite a bit here in the spring and then it got down here really low. So that's why ponderosa pines tend to be, or you know, pines in general, you can see they tend to be much more fire prone than oak trees, which hold their moisture so well. As you're picking plants, you know, as spring comes along, don't forget that you can use cowscape. And sometimes um, within their descriptions of the plants, they will actually talk about the fire resistance or the fire nature of it. And we do have a list on our El Dorado CNPS site. It's kind of a neat list that Ray Griffith put together. He was a uh, horticulture professor at the Folsom Lake College. And what's really neat here is he's gone through lots of the, our native plants and not only has given them a score from one to 10 for fire resistance, but also he's scored them for drought and deer and shade and wildlife and also has some comments on them. So this is really a great list. People really like lists and this is, the, you know, I don't think there's a better one than this for our area, but just remember that any plant can burn. No plant is fireproof. And so even a plant that comes out on a list is looking really good. Once you've evaporated off that water, the dead wood that's left behind will burn. So it's, let's be strategic here. Let's evaluate your house for a second. Let's think about the direction, the biggest dangers. So generally when you're trying to figure that out, you look at terrain and the wind weather and your vegetation. And so you wonder, okay, are you closer than 30 to 100 feet from a steep slope? If there's a steep slope like this and you're back 30 feet, you're probably fine. If it's super steep, then you might need to be back 100 feet. If you're right there on the edge though, you're much more fire prone than if you're back from the hill. So if you're above a canyon, like a box, if that, if that hill is actually a box canyon or a chimney or a gulch, it's, it's a chimney especially just really funnels fu uh, fire right up towards you. If you're on a saddle where you've got hills on both sides, it's more dangerous. And then which is the south or west side of your house? Because that's probably the driest. Your house is going to be the driest. The vegetation is going to be driest. 
And then what direction is your prevailing wind? You know, we had a, a bit of wind today. I don't, I can't remember. I think at our house, it really wasn't quite where the normal prevailing wind is. But um, here's a map, for example. Uh, here's Placerville. Here's Diamond Springs. You can see how in this pretty large area, it's going in that same direction as the prevailing wind. That's the area that normally a fire would be would be sent. But also there's these things called fern winds. If you're in Southern California, that'd be the Santa Ana winds. In Bay Area, they're called the Diablo winds. But I think all of them are fern winds, which are coming from the east, actually, and coming hot and dry over the Sierra and down across over from the north and from the east. And those can be the really intense winds that started things like, or rather that fanned the campfire, the Tubbs fire, the Woolsey fire, fires like that. So knowing where the north and east wind can matter. On the other hand, if you think about the King Fire, it went to the northeast. And um, so I'm not sure that we even have those fern winds as much here in our county as they do in other parts of California. The other thing is, so you've created a defensive space. That's great, but how close are other houses? We've talked about how that's really important. And so, in fact, they talk with the wooey about two kinds of wooey. There's the interface like this, where the homes are close to the wooey, even though they're not in it. And then there's the intermix, which are people on the rest of us on um, property that's like an acre or more. And so um, these the interface homes, the ones that are like this, about half of those losses are actually in the interface. So they're subdivisions. They're there are even urban areas that are within a mile or two of a wooey area. So it's really important to recognize that, that those people really need defensible space too, and especially they need to harden their homes. So if homes are 25 to 30 feet away, just know that that's an extra vulnerability. And same thing with your outbuildings or your neighbor's outbuildings. And so real quick, now we're gonna try this exercise with the paper and the pencil. So if you grab your paper, and right in the middle, you draw a house from the front. Doesn't have to look exactly like your house, just a quick cartoon house. And then draw two arrows, if that's the front of your house, from which side of your house goes to the downhill side, whether it's in front or whatever size. Go ahead and draw two arrows coming down from your house. And then go ahead and label the side of your house that's driest, wherever that is, the south side. And then if you know the prevailing wind, go ahead and put those in as a dashed line going towards your house. If you don't know where it is, that's okay. And then go ahead and label the north and east side for those possible fern winds, because when they come, they can be really intense, really drying, and right in the fall. And then if you have any outbuildings, whether it's a shed or a garage or a chicken coop, um, and it's closer than 30 feet to your house, go ahead and draw that in on which side of the house that is. And then if your neighbor is closer than 30 feet to your house, go ahead and draw them in on the side that they are, that they're the closest. And if you're not sure, then at some time measure, because the 30 feet really has a lot to do with that radiant heat. And the, the, if you're past the 30 feet, if you're 45, 50 feet, that's much, much better than if you're in, within 30 feet of another house. And again, if you have vegetation between the two houses, and you maybe don't want it if you're less than 30 feet away from each other. Okay, so once you've got all that on your little map here, on your piece of paper, go ahead and shade the sides of your house, your own particular house, they're especially vulnerable. So in this case, this house had a downhill side here, and again, because fire travels uphill, that's why this is a vulnerability, more so than the back of their house. But then they're vulnerable over here because they're too close to that other house, and they've got this here and the prevailing wind. So for this house, it's all kind of around this front semicircle. But go ahead and shade on your own which part of your house is vulnerable. And then as you're thinking about retrofits or defensible space, those are the sides that you want to maybe be a little more aggressive on or spend a little more money on to make them a little safer. Coming back again, um, and this is one more thing we're going to add to your map. We already talked about how these two fires were right on top of each other. Well, that actually turns out is often the case. You'd think that if you were in an area that hadn't burned in a long, long time that you're, you're just due, right? But that's not true, actually. There are certain areas that burn over and over and over and over. And if it's, if it's whether there's fuel there because of the last fire that then left a lot of dead fuel on the ground, or if it's partly because that's where wind is funneled and that's just where um, there's sort of a, a, 
the terrain and the wind are such that fires happen there. So here's, for example, the Rim Fire, and I think there's some like eight or nine fires within that area. The campfire, half of the campfire, which is this red perimeter here, had been burned within the 20, last 20 years. So these aren't areas that had never been burned. They're burning over and over again. If you look at El Dorado County, these are fires going back to, uh, what does it say, um, before 1950. Um, and you can see how there's certain areas like here where they happen again and again. Or down here in the south part below Highway 50, that's sort of the Latrobe area, I think, that uh, fires have happened again and again. Also up in this area, this doesn't have the King Fire on it, I don't believe, because this is doesn't quite go up high enough, but so the King Fire would be up in here too. So looking at this map, I know it's hard to tell, but this is Placerville here. This is El Dorado Hills down here, and Pollock would be up here. If you think you might be in one of those high risk areas, go ahead and put a star on your house to remind you that you might want to be a little extra careful about things like retrofits and defensible space. Okay, so put that aside and just remember um, to, to think about, use that as you're planning your own um, pre preparations for being ready for wildfire. And what I'm gonna do here real quickly is we're gonna look at an actual house and I didn't wanna diss somebody else's house, so I'm gonna diss our house. So this is our house when we first bought it and these are all extremely flammable plants right up against our, our wall, um, which we even back then realized was not a good idea and we got rid of them all. This is the back of the house. We've been here now 35 years, so we've done some uh, remodeling. But if you look at this, you probably see some vulnerabilities. And actually, we had done some things already. We had replaced a wooden chair with a metal chair. We'd taken 10 feet out of this deck. This deck used to go right up to the house, but it was a 30-year-old deck. And we felt that was a real vulnerability. We knew there was an old patio underneath, so we just removed 10 feet. That was cheap, but a lot of work. Um, we actually did replace our vents with those fancy ones there because we felt it was kind of close to some of the vegetation here. We had a board here from this fence that went right across that we took out. And yet there's still some things, and that's why this is a process. If you look at this, there's still some things, more things that needed to be done. Here we had a plastic rain uh, barrel right there that, that were plastic burns. Here we still had this little bit of wood, and what if a lot of embers collected right here? It's an inside corner, which is more vulnerable, so I really need to do something about that. And here we had a bad house, which probably isn't the smartest thing to have near your door, we know now with coronavirus, but we also had this plastic container here where we were connect, collecting bat guano. And again, plastic burns, so when embers get there, this was a real vulnerability. So um, we also kind of looked near one of those back doors and saw there was some decayed wood and decayed wood burns at a much lower temperature than uh, good wood. And also, and this is something you might want to do is right after a big windstorm, in fact, today might qualify tomorrow morning. If you look and see where, well, there's not a lot of dead leaves though, but if you look in the fall after a windstorm like that, where dead leaves collect. And we did that, walked around, I actually took pictures so I'd, I'd remember and this part of the house is great. You know, there's six inches of foundation like they're supposed to be, and that's really not too much of a, a problem. But look about over here. Here, for some reason, our wood signing comes right down to the um, patio, and so as leaves build up here, you can imagine a couple of embers getting in there, and that starts to burn, and it could catch this on fire, which then can catch everything on fire. It's even an inside corner. So we realized that was a real vulnerability. Plus, we noticed the rodents had eaten away at our cat door. And so what we did then is we closed that up with plywood. We built in this little um, um, brick wall in front of our siding. We changed out the water barrel with something that was metal. We replaced that wooden deck with a cement and brick deck. And we got rid of the back guano plastic thing that was on the wall. This is what it looks like when you start to close in eaves. Again, we felt that our house is extremely low right here. And with some of the oaks right there, we decided we really, on this side, needed to close in our eaves. And um, it's, a, it's a bit of a job, but it's not too bad. You can also replace the vents. Here's another place where we realized we had fiberglass screening here. And fiberglass screening just melts and burns. And so um, that was a problem. We had this very old door with all these little partly decayed things. You can imagine embers getting in there and that this was a wooden frame. And so if this burned, then that burned and went to the house. We had these old steps that we were practically falling through that needed to be replaced. And so what we did is we replaced those with um, concrete and rock. We replaced this door with metal. 
and a metal screening. So now we're not worried that this is wood here because by having the metal here, it's not gonna catch that on fire. We replaced all that fiberglass screening with metal screening. Bronze actually is better than aluminum because aluminum isn't actually very fireproof, it turns out. And we were careful to put it right up to the edge so no embers could collect. Just, just kind of giving you an idea of the stuff that we did. And yes, we had removed all of our plants that used to be right next to the house. Here's another one where we took this out because it went right up to the house and that was a vulnerability. Um, again, we replaced the wooden furniture we had with metal furniture. Well, a lot of these fires happen at night. Um, they might happen when you're on vacation. So for us, we felt it was much safer just to have metal out there. And then we had this old deck that, again, you're practically falling through. And so this was our COVID project. We turned it into rock and brick and cement. So think like an ember. Walk around your house. Think about where can an ember enter a gap. So caulking is really important. You want to caulk all those gaps you have. Where can it hit something in combustible? Imagine flicking flames out there, you know, matches or something. Where, where might it catch small things on, on fire that would then catch big things on fire? And take photos. So you remember, think, take photos after a windstorm and then prioritize. It doesn't have to be all done at once. You make a three-year plan or a four-year plan or whatever it is that fits your budget. And here's another example now. After removing those other plants, over the next 20, 30 years, I painstakingly brought in native plants. Every one of those was carefully hand-watered, and I had created what was not a fire-safe landscape anymore. And it was very, very painful to have to take some of those out, especially, again, the birds just loved this thing. We had so many nesting species of birds. And this is what it looks like today. Now, it's not quite as stark as that because these things aren't leafed out. I took this just a few days ago, and when they're leafed out, it doesn't look quite so bad. But a lot of those plants, I just moved further out and made, um, got them further away from the house, out 45, 50, 70, 80 feet. And you, I don't want to remove plants or trees, right? Look at all the wonderful things plants and trees do. They provide shade, they're habitat, they're aesthetically pleasing, they're good for our home values. They don't let erosion happen. They protect our water quality. They make us happy. They can prevent invasives. They sequester carbon. All these things are great things. But we really have to be cognizant and we need to tend our landscapes the same way the indigenous communities tended the wild and make sure that we're not creating things that are increasing those uh, hazards of fire, wildfire. Here's another example real quick of a house. Let's see what they would do. You can see their biggest vulnerability right now. They'd start at the house. They'd get rid of the things that were right within five feet. They've got this tremendous huge area of shrubs that should be um, thinned out. They've got too much stuff right along their road. They've got this tree that's overhanging their house. So they changed that to a patio. They decided they probably should still get rid of those. They got rid of those. And then they made a less of a connection to the chaparral. The chaparral here, out here is fine. It doesn't have to be changed. And they might have even gone a little overboard here in um, disconnecting it. But um, their house itself is much safer now. And their road is better too. If it were I, I probably would have taken these bushes out and put a tree here instead so they had some shade over their patio. But the difference is dramatic actually in the fire resilience of the house above. So does this stuff work? This is a survivor of the campfire up in paradise. They had recently upgraded their roof and their vents and they had no plants next to the house and they survived. This is what uh, my brother-in-law called a freckle that you'd go through and everything be gone and then there'd be a little house like this that had survived. Fire safe councils are a great way to get involved and um, especially you can get involved with them and make sure they understand about native plants and you can work with them to keep your community safer. And if we look real quick now at the future, we'd started out with risk in this map of California, and the risk is only getting worse. It's not getting better. Um, there's lots of built up fuel. There's more people, and with more people, there's more chance of ignitions. There's also more electric infrastructure that can get hit and broken and start fires. And of course, with climate change, we've got serious problems because models suggest that the wildfire seasons are going to be longer. The vegetation is going to be drier, which means there's also going to be more of these droughts that might make our vegetation drier, which means they'll burn even more quickly. 
there won't necessarily be more wildfires, but they think that the wildfires, there are more of them will be intense and more of them will be damaging. And so if 2020 was bad and you saw the huge spikes, they think that things are even heading more that direction. So we have choices, right? We have choices. We can mitigate, we can take some of the fuel out, make the fires smaller, we can take care of our landscapes. We can adapt by hardening our homes as well. And the third choice, we can suffer. And the mix of that is up to us and what we decide. We can have it like this, where we have lots of suffering. We maybe don't wanna spend the money to mitigate. We don't want to really change our lifestyle to, to slow down climate change. We say, oh, that's too expensive. We don't want to change the way we're doing things. We'd rather spend lots of money on adapting and we'll end up doing some suffering. Or we can really change things around and reduce that suffering, do more to mitigate climate change, more to mitigate um, the landscape of the healthy forest, the healthy woodlands, and still be doing some adapting, but reduce our suffering. And how do we mitigate and adapt all those that we talked about? Well, the built up fuel, by reducing the fuel through the landscape work and prescribed burns for more people, we can mitigate and adapt by improving our electric infrastructure, maybe putting some of it underground, although that's not as simple as it sounds, wildfire education of people who are here and all of us working to make our houses safer. And for climate change, reducing those greenhouse gas emissions because it's just so important. And it doesn't matter that it's going to cost a lot of money. We really have to do something about that. So living in the wildland urban interface, the WUI comes with responsibility to protect our homes and our communities, both the natural ones and the built ones. We need to tend the wild. We need to take care of these foothills that we live in. It's no one thing that's going to reduce risk completely. Remember, it's a system of things together, those three things I was talking about. And definitely creating defensible space and hardening homes is hard work. Believe me, Lustra and I know that. We have been working really hard over the last couple of years. But this is hard work too. Oh, so are, you, um, are you up for answering some questions? I've got like two minutes more, maybe one more minute, okay? Okay, great. Okay, so resources, two really good resources that I'm recommending as one is Tending the Wild. It's a tome. You've probably heard of it. I really recommend that you actually read it. It's about 500 some pages. It reads really well and it's fascinating to learn about the many ways that the indigenous people um, tended the wild and continue to tend the areas that we live in. I also highly recommend this book, California Native Gardening, which talks about maintaining good ways to maintain our bushes and such and such and our plants and our native plants it does a nice month by month guide it's the best one i've seen it's maybe even the only one i've seen for maintenance of our native gardens then i've got this resource list that does these various topics it talks lots of more detail on home hardening defensible space fire ecology management of different california vegetation types I'm also landscaping with native plants which including fire resistive if anybody's interested in getting that resource list i don't want to just send it out to everybody, but you put your email in the chat and I will send it to you. And real quickly, I want you to read this yourself. So don't be afraid. Be ready, evaluate your house, your yard, do the most important things first, keep going and maintain in the future. And finally, don't forget to enjoy these amazing foothills we call home. Thank you and I wanna thank all the researchers, people like um, Steve, uh, I'm forgetting names now, Steve Quiles, Quarles, <laughs> and also, um, Jack Cohen and all these people are out there trying to get this kind of information out to the public. There's so much information out there. It's just amazing how much is getting out there to help all of us uh, be safer. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Questions. I'm going to start with one. One thing I've always uh, found challenging is estimating what was five feet, 10 feet, 30 feet from my house. Do you have any recommendations on how to do that? The best thing is to actually measure. That's a really good question. Cause it, it, 
lots of times you'll be completely off on the 100 feet or the 30 feet. But get a tape measure and measure it. And what I try to do is when I've done that once, because it's kind of a pain, is try to remember specific trees and specific rocks so I then know, okay, that's 30 feet. Okay, that's that. I mean, the five feet is pretty easy because you just imagine yourself lying down in front of the house. But for the others, I really recommend actually measuring because those numbers are based on science, actually. Um, what about replacements for wooden fencing near a house? Well, excellent question. So what they suggest for wooden fencing is you don't have to replace the whole thing, even if you just replace the last five feet or maybe the 10 feet, but for sure the last five feet, you can put in a wire section there. You can have a metal gate there. Just that last five feet is, is the most important. So it doesn't act as a fuse bringing it up to your house. What about wooden posts that support a porch roof? Is there a paint that can fireproof wood? People always wish that there was a fireproof paint or a fireproof treatment, but the problem is that they don't really seem to last well with um, with weathering, and so they really don't recommend those. Although you can buy things and they call them fire resistant, they don't really recommend it as, as being any better than normal paint. Um, one person remembers reading about a product that can be sprayed on plants and trees to make them more fire resistant. Do you know anything about that? Um, kind of the same answer. They don't necessarily weather well, and it's something everybody wants to be able to do. But in terms of actually working, there's not good evidence for that. Going through the list here, we have 16 new messages. Um, just to say, mention everybody, this will be on our YouTube channel in about a week. Oh, um, right. If you want to revisit the um, the talk, let's see. So yes, uh, the person who asked about accessing the slideshow. Uh, one person said some of these mitigation efforts would be really expensive if you have to hire someone. Is there any chance of getting reductions on insurance or financial help? You know, that's such a good question. And there have been pushes in the state legislature because you can get um, like tax incentives and stuff for doing earthquake work. But currently there's nothing to have no programs to really help people with hardening their homes and it can be expensive. And that's why it's really important to one, recognize which side of your house might be most vulnerable, realize which priorities the UC is suggesting, you know, first like siding is the last one. It's probably the most expensive other than roof. But um, yeah, it can be expensive. And so trying to prioritize is probably the best thing. The other thing is that by removing those plants away from your five feet, by get, making a zone that's, that's free of plants, you've gone a huge way towards helping your house, even if you can't do some of those other things. Because if your window doesn't have any plants near it, then it's probably you know, not that terrible, that it, even if it's single pane. If your siding doesn't have any plants in front of it, it's okay that it's wood siding. So the easiest, cheapest thing to do is to get rid of plants, unfortunately. Anybody else have questions? You can unmute yourself and ask her if you'd like. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead. Getting comments in here. Some people said, thank you so much. Um, uh, Alice, uh, I had some firefighters who were also uh, home hardening experts. And they told me to just leave the toy in because it was native, but I appreciate your comment about clearing out the, the grunge, I guess, underneath. And so maybe I'll leave the toy in and just clear out underneath. Yeah, definitely. That's kind of what we did because we had one where it was out 30 feet, but within 100 feet, and we took out some of those dead ones. And I feel like it's perfectly fine now. Yeah, it depends on how close it is. I mean, if it was 10 feet away, that'd be another thing. But if it's out there 30, 40 feet, then I, yeah. It's a great tree for birds too. Anyone else? Well, as I mentioned, this is gonna be up on our YouTube channel in about a week. And um, I did include the YouTube channel link in the email that went out. So if you still have that message, you should see the Great. channel in there. Great, thank you, Kathleen. And the other thing is um, on those resources, there's a really neat YouTube by Jack Cohen, who's one of the first people to recognize the importance of these embers and stuff. Um, and so again, if you give me your email in the chat, I'll send you that resource list, but I really highly recommend that little video, the little YouTube there. 
Thank you, Alice. Applause, 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 applause. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Applause. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your interest in native plants and fire safety. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alice.